Okay, so welcome everyone. Um, thanks for joining us for this. Um, as we'll be hearing from Ian in a minute, this is the um, multiple time we've run this session. Um, we've run this a few times and got good feedback on it, so hopefully you're going to enjoy it. Um, I'm not going to say very much. I'm going to hand over quite shortly to Ian, who's going to give us a bit of an intro to the theory. Um, there is going to be some grip work. So once you've had a bit of an intro to that, we're going to get you into breakout rooms, um, work on some questions, thinking about what errors students might make with them. Um, and then in the second half, Chris is going to show us how we might use tools like Stack to try and address these errors in automated assessment. OK, so um, I'm just going to hand over now to Ian and let's get started. Thanks, George. OK, I'm going to share again. If you could just confirm yep. whether you can see the correct thing. Great. OK. Yeah, so I'm just going to present a, a bit of a sort of background. I don't think I'll say anything revelatory that people aren't aware of, but hopefully I'll provide a bit of formality and a bit of common language um, for the afternoon. Yeah, so just a bit of history um, and a, a thanks to our funders. So, so this sort of style of workshop we first did in summer 2019, uh, funded by PME, the International Society for Psychology of Maths Education. So thank you for them. And uh, originally started with a colleague who's not with us today, who's presumably tucked up in bed in Auckland, which is Igor. So yeah, this is our fourth event. Um, there's been one at Loughborough, one in Auckland, and this is the second time we're in Edinburgh. So yeah, our focus is on student errors and how to think about them. Uh, yeah, so a, a definition of errors, in case any of us are in doubt what a mathematical error looks like, but we're particularly focusing on what we're going to be calling systematic errors. So we're not interested in just you know, the equivalent of typos or arithmetic slips, but we're interested in sort of patterns of errors, common errors that, that perhaps help reveal something about a student's uh, mathematical way of thinking. Uh, oh yeah, and also, I mean, we're not interested in exotic, well, we are, they're quite interesting, exotic, rare examples, but, you know, we're interested in these common errors so that it's worth us thinking, doing something, and that's, uh, yeah, that can be quite an important point, actually, especially when you're designing stack questions of not going down rabbit holes of chasing fairly obscure errors. Uh, wait a minute, keep losing focus. Um, yeah, so we have had this workshop before. So um, you know, we're all uh, we're all professionals here who uh, have done some teaching of maths. So you know, hopefully there'll be a lot of things coming from you, the participants, this afternoon. But yeah, here's a here's an example just to read out the top one. When taking the fifth root of a number, students will do five times the square root. So I'm sure we're all bursting with these sorts of uh, common errors that that we see. Uh, but I, I'm going to provide, I'm going to step back and provide a little bit of theorising about it. Um, and we're going to sort of ground this in empirical evidence. So I think this is some quite high quality research. And these three contemporary accounts are, for example, they're not exhaustive or comprehensive, but just to help us sort of focus into the sort of thing. So I'm going to talk about natural number bias. Um, which actually does affect even research mathematicians, as evidence for. Something called visual saliency, uh, linked into the notation of mathematics and how that can uh, help or hinder students. And yeah, overgeneralization. I mean, natural number bias and even visual saliency are a form of overgeneralization. So they're not necessarily mutually exclusive. Yes, yeah, so a natural number bias, it's the idea that our, our sense of um, real world numbers uh, for a lot of this research has been done at school level. So uh, positive integers can um, lead students to make common mistakes. So thinking that a tenth is bigger than a third, um, the evidence is that 10 is bigger than 3, so this gets overgeneralized, the natural number bias, in order to thinking that a tenth is uh, bigger than a third. And there's various other examples around 4.5 um, is less than 4.223, 4.5 is 
Again, why? Well, the evidence suggests it's to do with natural numbers. 223 is bigger than five, um, is the idea there. And uh, we can see this not just in numbers, but in arithmetic operations as well. So adding denominators um, rather than focusing on the numerators, because when you add 10 to 3 normally, you get 13. So why not in that case? So that's, that's a sort of fairly sort of classic example of, of the sorts of common errors that are systematic, that might have some grounding, might reveal student thinking in a way that's helpful for us. Um, yeah, I'm just stuck in some, some articles, just in case anyone thinks there's no evidence for these things. They're, they're, they're well evidenced. Uh, visual saliency. Uh, this was from a really nice paper, actually, by Kirshner and Autry. Really clever design. I think it's a really nice example of how um, maths education can be done. But uh, I'm just doing a brief overview of findings. I'm not going to talk about the methods they used at all. But this visual saliency, it's uh, a really nice, powerful idea. The idea that often notation helps us. I mean, mathematical notations evolved in such a way to be helpful a lot of the times. Um, so the example on the top left there. But again, this overgeneralization that permeates a lot of these common errors um, can lead to something like on the top right there. So it's this idea that, that sometimes in maths and often in maths, the notation is kind of intuitive or there's this sort of visual resemblance, saliency as they call it. But other times it's unhelpful or it can be um, overgeneralized. So there's a a couple of examples there from, from the paper. So much more tied up with notation, I think, visual saliency than the natural number bias, which is perhaps more rooted in, in early experiences. Um, oh yes, uh, just, just to keep Chris happy, the, uh, the hated log notation can uh, cause this. I actually taught logarithms to my foundation students last year, uh, last week, and yeah, they don't like it. Um, and yes, yeah, so overgeneralization sort of permeates the previous examples. Uh, another sort of chestnut from school level work is the idea that the equal sign means do the arithmetic on the left and then write the result here. So you end up with these sort of chained um, number sentences um, like at the bottom. And we know that um, uh, misconceptions around the equal sign are evident in, in adults, including um, undergraduates as well. So, oh yes, and there's uh, some more evidence for that. So yeah, so that, that's what we're doing this afternoon in a way. We're going to think about errors that we see. Um, we're going to think about those common systematic errors. And what we're going to do is theorise. We are going to speculate on what um, errors might mean for how students think. So yeah, trying to find an account for students' responses and actions based on the evidence we get when they make um, errors. And theorising, uh, I mean, theory can have a bad name in education, but done well, it's critical to uh, scholarly thinking about education. If our theories have some accuracy, some resemblance to what's going on in the real world, then as well as accounting student errors, they can help us to communicate. So we're gonna have some um, common language. Yeah, have explanatory power, like in the examples that I showed before, you can link the errors they're making to perhaps some experiences that students have had before. They tend to be all quite inherently constructivist, um, these theories um, based around common errors and overgeneralization. Yeah, it can enable prediction, very important for the last section of this afternoon's uh, seminar when we look at, and that's really where a lot of this has come from, I think, for those of us involved in organising it. We're trying to design resources, we've got the power of a computer algebra system, and as I mentioned before, you sometimes spend an afternoon programming feedback to a question and you think, will, it, will a student ever trigger this? So we want to be able to predict these errors. Um, and then respond to them. Yeah, and, and help us as teachers uh, think about things, I guess, we can abstract once we've got a theory away from these errors. Yeah, we want it applicable to a wide range of learning phenomena, I guess. So um, that's what's nice about the theory, the way overgeneralization kind of wrapped all those examples together that I gave um, earlier. 
Okay, uh, epistemologically solid. If Igor was here, I'd perhaps get him to, to define that. But yeah, we, we are looking for that common language. We're not really, well, I suppose we are, it's academia. We are looking to create debate and that's healthy and needed. But we're also looking to try and form some sort of uh, coherent body of, of knowledge about these things. Graspable in a short time. I mean, if we're going to um, expect practicing teachers, you know, people who wouldn't perhaps invest time to come into a, a seminar like this afternoon or aren't, don't dabble so much in education research, we want this to be communicable and usable by your, uh, dare I say, communal garden lecturers who've, who've got better things to do than engage in education or, or directly in education. So the language we're going to use for this afternoon um, has come from this guy. This is uh, Fishbane, and he talked about tacit models. Um, yeah, so I guess I quite like um, this quote. The main psychological problem is that we are not naturally equipped to manipulate concepts and operations, the consistency of which is not supported by some empirical um, evidence. Yeah, so this sort of uh, maths being this subject that is abstract, that, that perhaps does originate in our uh, personal empirical interactions with the world, but just like in the examples that we've seen, that can trip us up as much as it helps us. Um, yeah, so Fishbane's idea is that we can think about tacit models. It's almost, a tacit model is almost like a, a mini theory of mind that we might have of a given student when we see them uh, make a mistake or struggle with some maths in one of these systematic ways that we might identify we can think about them having a, a tacit model the student might not be able to articulate it they might not be able to give a, a declarative um, definition of how they're thinking but tacitly we can sort of see about how they're modeling that what their, their internal mental model is of the maths in that moment. It doesn't necessarily mean that a tacit model is a, a, a thing within their mind or a consistent thing. It is cued by um, different contexts, such as the notation we use. But that idea that the tacit model is, is something that we are theorising about the, the mind of the student and their mathematics. Great, so... What I'm going to do now is sort of lead into the group activity. So you're going to be doing something a bit like this um, that you're going to be introduced to. So we might have a multiple choice question like this. In fact, we're going to have many multiple choice questions. So, um, yes, yeah, students might be presented with this. And what we're going to do this afternoon is make predictions about how students answered, about how many students answered correctly, but Importantly and interestingly, what the common distractors might be. So taking, uh, so this data has come from Auckland. This came from our absent colleague, Igor, for multiple choice tests used there. So um, there was 94 students sat this question in 2016. But we'll, we'll think about percentages rather than raw numbers. So you might want to guess in your head, which is what we'll be asking you to do this afternoon. And there's the figures. So we've got around 60% going for plain, but we've got about 20% answering line. Um, so what's our tacit model there? I guess it's that it's that overgeneralization in a way that something like y equals 2x plus 1, it's the equation of a line, and you, you, know, you kind of can't argue with that. Um, but the students are, in the language here, disregarding um, the space that we're working in. Uh, and there's some more data there, and that's quite satisfying to see that there is some stability in the data, and that, that's what we're looking for, things where it, I guess that's the systematic component of it. We've got something rec replicable there. Yeah, OK, um, I think I might just skip over that little... Uh, extra sort of a uh, couple of quotes just talking a little bit about tacit models but hopefully that uh, that rushed through little discussion has been enough to get us in the mood for this which is our small group activity so yeah so these multiple choice questions were were used um, in live exams at the University of um, Auckland so we are dealing with real world data here it wasn't connected in a sort of um, research context 
yeah, and I think that's it for this. Oh no, we have got the instructions here. I don't know if they were still attached. Okay, good. So for each question you're presented, question meaning each multiple choice question that you're presented, um, we're going to ask you to design the distractors. So we're going to ask you to sort of imagine what tacit models of students thinking underlie your options. Um, so it's it's a bit of a sort of forcing ourselves to think by playing a guessing game based on our experiences and our intuitions of how students um, are. Uh, but then we will reveal the real options that were provided so we can compare our own suggested distractors with those that were um, given in the actual exam and, and what might someone have had in mind if, if there are distractors that we don't think of in our small groups, what might the examiner um, have in mind. Then for part step three, let's uh, place your bets please, let's just have a bit of fun and you know or have a little gamble, what sort of percentages do we think we're going to see? And that is an important thing, because if just one or two students out of a hundred make a mistake now and again, okay, important for working with those students, but we're kind of work, trying to work at a more general level, dealing with um, large groups of students and designing resources. So we're interested really in those, those strong distractors that, that quite a few students might choose. Then we can reveal the actual empirical data and um, we can see how surprised or not we are and is that going to impact on our teaching practices. And I think that is the last slide, great. There we go, on the dot. And I think I've stopped sharing as well. Thank you. Um, great and perfect timing. Um, also, with perfect timing, Malta seems to have dropped out of the call. So something must have gone wrong with his internet. Um, and we were so perfectly prepared, he had all the breakout rooms ready to go. Um, it looks like the host baton has passed to you, Ian. I wonder if you can pass it on to me. So I think what you need to do is go into the participant list. Participant list, yeah, and there you are. More make host, OK. OK. Yeah. Okay, so I should be able to get the breakout rooms going. Um, I'll give you each, so while I'm doing that, I'll give you a couple of minutes to, oh, Malta's back, good. Um, so maybe what I'll do is pass the baton back to Malta and I can explain to you um, how to click around inside the course and get onto the task that Ian was just describing. So I'll pass host back to Malta so that you can set up the, the breakout rooms again. Sure. Thanks. Sorry about that. Right. <laughs> just typical to have a, a Wi-Fi breakdown down just now, in it? Crucial moment as well. Okay. So that's you back to being host, I think. Um, and I'll just show everyone where we're at in the course. So it should just be the same page where you got the Zoom link. Um, now down at the bottom, you should see a, a quiz has appeared. Um, so we have the, the instructions that we're on Ian slide. Once you go into the quiz, um, what we've got set up is the question, and then you've got the options which are blank. Um, and we'd like you to fill out what what you would put as the options there, and give a reason. So it would be good if um, the correct answer was there. So maybe your reason for option A is that this is the correct answer. Um, but then for some of the other ones, you know, what are the the tacit models that you're imagining might be behind that error. Now, when you submit that, do check, um, you'll see the, the options that were actually given. And at that point, you're asked to guess the percentages. So once you get onto the, the second part there, you can have a discussion about did the options match up with the ones that you picked? What might be behind the, the ones that um, maybe were there originally that you hadn't guessed? Um, and then come up with what you think are the, the likely percentages. And then once you submit that, the, the answer is revealed. Um, and you'll see how the students in Auckland actually did get on with those questions. Okay, so what you've got is quite a few to work through. Um, there's four different kinds and three different examples of each kind. So it might be that you want to work through all four kinds with your group and then go back and do some of the other ones. Um, I'll leave that up to you. Um, we're going to work on this for, um, I think, until 5-2, is that correct? Um, 
Yeah, that's right. Good. So we've got about half an hour. So um, are we ready to go off into rooms now? Yep. Right. I'll I'll open them up just now. Okay. Um, and I think Ian, you were notionally going to lead this bit and hear from different groups about how far they got. Yeah, that's right. So I mean, we, did we have three breakout rooms in the end there? Yeah, that's right. Got fifteen <laughs> minutes, so let, we don't have to be strict about this. But you know, five minutes per someone from each group to um, sort of uh, riff on on what happened in their group might be a, a rough strategy. So you know, others can chip in and the conversation might flow. But I'll. Um, um, come in if, if we don't get to another group. So if we, we ask uh, if we've got any reps from group one here. I'm not aware of what number my group was, I have to say. You, you were two. Yeah. <laughs> so that was Chris's group was group one. Yeah. Well, I think Ruth ought to do this one. Just so we can hear her voice, you know. I mean, we don't want to hear from Chris and, and me. Because we always hear from Chris, and so let's. Uh, Ruth, are you up for this? Yes, I'm just grabbing a cup of tea. Sorry. Oh, no, no, you can't do that. I <laughs> caught my tea. We'll, we'll chip in if we want to say anything extra. Okay, um, fine. So we got through. Um, I think quite a lot of the dot products questions, and then um, I skipped to definite intervals, and I'm not too sure. Martin, you also skipped to one of the definite intervals questions. I did a definite integral, and then moved on to matrices. Yes. A couple so, of those. Um, so I think some of our intuition about kind of the most likely mistakes that students would make in terms of dot products, like um, not fully finishing the dot product, so ending up with a vector instead of a scalar, was kind of on point. Although there were a couple of points where I couldn't quite figure out what the students uh, or the, what the suggested mistaken answer was um, picking out. Although we were, we thought one of them particularly might have just been um, just just straight incorrect. There wasn't any like hugely motivated mistake, but I could be wrong there. Um, I guess in general, it's quite reassuring to see that most of the students, like a good majority of the students got the answers right. Um, and the ones that, um, so guessing the percentages, for the most part, I think, certainly I and maybe the rest of the group overestimated how many people would get the incorrect ones. So I said something like 10% might um, only end up with a vector where they've multiplied each of the components together. When actually it was more like um, eight or seven, or possibly even lower than that again. So I think when, certainly from my perspective, when I think of something that a student could do wrong, I seem to overestimate its likelihood. So I, I, and that's kind of what I. Yeah, I, I was I was doing that a big time to start off with, mm. and then I sort of looked at the responses and thought, hmm, I better be a bit more nuanced about this. So. Yeah. I guess our students are more inventive than the Auckland ones. <laughs> yes, maybe we should try this out in Edinburgh and see what happens. <laughs> That's a nice way to put it. What I'll do is I'll skip around the groups to make sure we get, and we might come back around again. So, um, yes, someone other than me from uh, group two. I think you're muted, Brian, if you were diving yeah. in. Well, uh, I think with the other cameras off, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Yeah, so we, we tried um, one from each of the categories, the dot products, the integrals. In fact, we did two of those and the matrices, and we, we looked at them together. Um, so again, um, we weren't, I think we weren't great at predicting how many students were getting the right answers. Um, and then I think the other, the other thing that came up is that, and please jump in, uh, John or Lisa, uh, well, we found that um, it was in some sense easy to come up, and maybe this was a feature of the questions we were looking at, but in some sense we found it easy to come up with one good distractor, um, but coming up with a second and third good distractor was a little bit trickier, 
you know, so for the integrals, there was a, we looked at questions that were both of which related to area. And there were, as I say, an obvious distractor that you just charge ahead with the procedure for evaluating a definite integral. Um, but with the way the question is set up, there's a negative and a positive contribution and there's a cancellation. And so you don't get actually get the area. So there was an obvious distractor there. But then where the other answers may have come from was was less obvious to us. And we, we couldn't really come up with good third and fourth, um, as well second and third distractors, third and fourth um, answers. Um, Although we did come up with one good third distractor, but it turned out to also accidentally be the correct answer. <laughs> That's right, yes. Yeah. We didn't actually, it yeah. just shove, uh, shove, a, yeah. <laughs> shove a number in, you didn't actually need to integrate or think about the area at all. So uh, perhaps a, a duff question there, I can say with Igor and all yeah. the And then something else that we saw in terms of the, 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 the numbers of students who selected the different answers um, that, I think certainly reinforced my experience is that no matter what you write for option C and D, let's call them, you'll get five or 10 percent of students, certainly in that very large cohort there of nearly, I think, it's a thousand students. You get five or 10 percent who are going to pick option C and D, regardless of where those things came from. So um, I'm not sure how much weight I would give to seeing a distractor that you know, attracted just 5% or just 10% of the, the, the students uh, to that answer. You know, is there a student who's answering to a pattern or just picking option D every time? Or I think John suggested that maybe they've uh, misclicked if they're doing the, the, the test online. So I kind of feel like, and I, I don't know, I'd be curious to know if there's any um, established opinion on this or sort of evidence-based opinion on it. I just feel like some some a response rate or rather yeah, a selection rate, let's say, of seven percent or whatever is kind of noise. And I, I, I'm not sure how much um, weight I would give to to that. But yeah, interesting, an interesting, fun exercise. Um, all right. Yeah. OK, thanks, Brian. So let's uh, ask someone from group three to wait. John, did you signal there to speak? Oh, uh, no, no, I was just agreeing. I was just thanking Brian, agreeing, basically. OK, yeah, group three, room three. Uh, well, if nobody else wants to volunteer, I can I can volunteer. I mean, I think our experiences were similar. We didn't get particularly far. Uh, we were discussing um, the first two questions a lot. Um, we uh, like group two we found that the um the kind of there was a there was an obvious distractor question and beyond that it was well okay they might differentiate instead of integrating they might integrate badly but then if they've essentially if they've caught the big trick then they're probably we felt they were probably going to sort of do the rest of the question correctly and actually if they're integrating badly there's numerous ways they could integrate badly so it's, it sort of felt hard to catch um Similar for the, the 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 other one that we did, which was the, the the very first question with the dot product, we kind of felt well, okay, ending up with a vector is sensible. Um, I suppose there's a few ways you could sort of do that, um, but otherwise, then we were sort of like you said, we were sort of clutching at straws trying to find well, if they just do the maths wrong, they'll end up with some integer between minus four and four or something, you know, and 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 it's difficult to come up with a multiple choice. Thing that will test that i suppose so that's that was that was our sort of feeling but we yeah we felt there was there was usually one or two things you could do that were a, a good trap if you like and then beyond that it was kind of hard to see how you would um you know and we we actually i have to say we did overestimate the number of people who would get that second question right we more we were surprised by the number of people who did actually just naively integrate the expression um so I think that's that's what we found with, with those. Yeah, thanks, Patrick. Yes, it's interesting because um, I mean, there's a, a colleague of mine who says that actually there's not many tacit models out there in the world. There's not all that many misconceptions. And, you know, you look at the presentation I just did, it, it's all those old chestnuts, isn't it, that a lot of us know about, those common errors. And 
yeah, you know, is it, um, is it fruitful to take this approach? We know the classics, but do we really need to go hunting and hunting and hunting? Um, and another thing, I think, I think I've got this off you, George, who in turn, I think you said this is maybe something Toby at Edinburgh has said about, you know, we think we should have these distractors in multiple choice questions, but why? I mean, it, it provides great fun for us to analyse them and think about them. But in terms of learning, if, if you're giving students practice tests, is there a danger that um, these tacit models live? Because you see your tacit model answer, your ticket, and it gets reinforced possibly. Uh, anyway, two or three minutes left before the next session if anybody else wants to dive in. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd like to say a few things about, um, sorry about the phone, that'll stop in a moment. Um, the, the problem we've all faced is, is coming up with reasonable distractors. And so um, the, the Brian mentioned also that they, the answer that their distractor led to the correct answer. And that's a problem. For example, A squared could be interpreted as 2A and it's 4 right, if A is 2. So with random parameters, you have, to be, you have to actually algebraically code up, you know, we're not having these parameters in. Um, you, you set them equal to each other and they've all got to be unique. That makes multiple choice questions pretty difficult to set, um, let alone the, the uh, distractors, the problem with the distractors. I rather like the idea of using distractors on revealed multiple choice questions, or revealed um, numerical input questions, uh, or even revealed multiple choice questions where you get the first, you, you put in the option and it checks to see if it's right. If it isn't, then it checks the second distractor, the third distractor, and so forth. And you can have as many or, or as few as you want behind the scenes. Um, Cliff Beavers came up with the revealed multiple choice, where these are really, really savage for students. Sudden death. You get your first option, and you accept it, or you, do, you reject it. If you accept it, you're done. And if you reject it, you never see it again. And you don't know how many, how many options you're going to be presented with. There could be three, there could be 10. Um, and these really are a great way of stressing out students if you want to do that. Um, so yeah, that's definitely something to, to think about. I, I think multiple choice questions have their, their uses, um, but they are very difficult to, to set, much more difficult than revealed numerical input questions, where if you can only think of two distractors, that's all you need. It's still a valid question. Um, whereas you've got to have four distractors or however many um, you, you've got in a multiple choice, whether you like it or not. And that's a real problem. Um, one of the distractors I had for a, a, an integral, the sym symmetry integral, was that it's equal to zero. Now that's, that's probably used by most students. I wasn't expecting the other options to be A greater than zero and A less than zero and A infinity. I would have said you can't, it's undefined because you haven't told me what f of x is. So, you know, there's there's different ways of looking at this question altogether and you don't know how students are going to interpret it. I think it depends slightly on what the question's for, because if, if the question's there purely to assess, then I agree that you definitely need a certain number of options. But if you're doing them in a completely formative sense so that you're not assessing then possibly all you need is, is the one distractor with appropriate feedback so that, because then you've got a clue as to where the student's wrong. And maybe the third choice is just, I haven't a clue, which can then, the student can click it if they simply do not know where to start. And then again, you can send them off to feedback that sends them to an easier quiz or something. Um, but it, it depends on whether it's for assessment or for teaching, I guess. Well, these last two comments from Martin and Haley towards how should we design questions provides an excellent 20 past four segue to Chris, who's going to tell us exactly how we should. <laughs> 